Welcome to Startup Simplified Abey. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Vipin. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this and making time. It's been a while that we've been coordinating, and we are finally able to do this. Uh, super happy. Uh, let's get started with a very quick introduction, right? Uh, I would rather let you do that. Uh, just, just give us a brief idea about who you are and what are you building. Sure. So, uh, I've been in Nisha, you know, since 1986 when my parents moved here, and uh, so I'm, uh, you know, obviously Indian, but yeah. uh, I do me now my kids also. Feel that they are very very Indonesian, <laughs> uh, so that's probably a large part of my identity. Uh, this country. Uh, so we we moved here. I did you know my schooling all here, and uh, and as a result, I sort of have always thought about education in this country. Hmm. Uh, you know, as 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 anyone who's grown up as an expat in this country, what you realize is one of the things that strikes you is you have great great people, right? Some of the nicest people on the True. planet. Uh, but often you'll end up talking about the education system here and mm. and how do you drive motivation so that became sort of a thing for me you know quite early on uh i got involved in tutoring from a very early age tutoring yeah so okay. I, I was actually already tutoring when i was in 7th 8th grade and what what were you tutoring back then back then i was tutoring korean kids english okay and then i st- started tutoring kids math okay then i went to college and i was still tutoring computer science uh so i've been you know uh doing that for large part of my life and then uh when i was in mba i also was focused on education during my second year but never ended up getting started we wanted to start an education business in india okay we got some very cool people on board okay but then it was me another indian guy and an american girl hmm. and uh uh i flew out here to indonesia to visit my brother mhm which year was this This was back in 2008. Okay. Okay. So I I flew out to this is my brother uh back then I just realized you know what uh, I love in Nisha too much mm. can't do it. Mm. Uh, and mm. so you know and the the American girl realized like you know she loves the US too much. Cap up the US. She said why are we building in India? And yeah. So that yeah. never happened but uh but eventually you know mm. uh over the course of uh a couple of businesses finally ended up on on Kolan. Uh so to answer your question you know who I am and mm. it's a large part of who I am uh uh being tied to Indonesia but what we're building is so Kolan is a online edtech platform um we focus on Indonesian students uh from 4th grade until 12th grade okay and our goal is you know to improve Indonesia's PISA rankings so mm-hmm. Indonesia what are PISA rankings for context yeah means uh across the OECD countries uh you know uh it's a standardized way of looking at achievement uh for students in math okay. science and reading math science and reading, reading yes. okay and uh indonesian students have since the rankings came out some 30 odd years ago mm-hmm. indonesian students have consistently been in the bottom 10% in the world right mm-hmm. and if it was a small country it's fine right but this is the fourth largest country in the world sure Uh, our goal, our mission is: How do you get Indonesian students from the top, the bottom ten percent, uh-huh. to the top fifty percent? And why are these rankings important? How do how do they play out in the larger scheme of things? Uh, be it in terms of the growth of economy, uh, the growth of that individual student itself. I mean, first, I guess you know, uh, economy wise, right? Uh-huh. Uh, today, people talk about Indonesia as being the powerhouse of Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. and a lot of the development in this country has been driven by natural resources but i think you know if you look at whether it's the us whether it's japan whether it's korea ultimate need has to be people uh you know that's human resources is the most precious resource that, that a country has true and i think you know when you, when you talk about indonesia i guess uh, a lot of the discussion and you know, a lot of the problems If you try to find, you know, what is the root cause, it will come back to education. So that's the link to the broader economy. To the student itself, uh, the reason why they measure these subjects because these are important subjects, right? Sure. Uh, you know, you need uh, math, for example. Uh, it is just the base of uh, problem solving, critical thinking. 
today with with AI taking over, I think the, you know the most important skill that people must have is just being good problem solvers, and that's what we tell people in our company as well. Forget you don't worry about titles, right? Hmm. Uh, most important skills because your job can just completely change, right? Correct. You know, Chad, you know, GPT three point five does one thing, four does something completely different, and your life changes. But as long as you pride yourself on being, and you know, you're good at being a problem solver, uh, you'll always be able to. Uh, uh, you'll always be relevant. I, I uh, just just on the topic of Chat GPT and AI, right? Uh, so there's a question which my nine year old son asked. Uh, I gave him some random answer. Now you being from the education industry, I want you to answer him, okay? And this answer will go directly to him, okay? Uh, just just imagine a nine year old asking you this. The question is, Papa, why do I need to learn maths? I can simply ask Chat GPT. It just gives the answer very quickly and my teacher also agrees the answer is correct. Right? Why why do I why do I need to do this? It's a good, it's a good question. Yeah. Uh fortunately not many of our students ask this yet, but probably they ask it to their parents. Yeah. Uh no, I I think it goes back to that same thing what I was telling you, right? Which oh. is look, it's maths is a great way to practice problem solving skills. Okay. You know, for example, uh you know, when you're asked a theorem and you have to figure out, you know, mm. uh, approve this theorem, right? Mm. It just takes a lot of thought behind it. Right? Mm. Uh, mm. You have to break a big problem down into smaller pieces, mm-hmm. uh, which is what problem solving is all about. So so you mean to say it's, it's a life skill apart from an academic skill? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And again, I think, you know, of, of all the different things that they associate with math, mm. I think the one that I find most relevant for the future is probably back to that, right? Which is oh. uh, problem solving because it's just so relevant to uh, the employment oh. uh, scenario as well. Sure, sure, sure. Let's let's talk about your uh, co-learn journey. You started off in 2018, right? And it started as a as an offline setup to begin with. If I'm if I'm not wrong, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so let's let's talk about that journey. Let's st- start. Let's uh, take us back in 2018. What was the thought process? How did it evolve uh, over a period of uh, time? You've seen pandemic as well. Uh, the move to digital completely and then reopening of offline centers and offline education mechanisms. Uh, plus, a lot has happened uh, globally in the edutech sector uh, as it is, right? So let's let's go back to 2018. What was the core thesis uh, from a business perspective, if you've talked about the problem, the, the problem statement's clear. What was the core thesis from a business perspective for you to get started over here? And what was the competition landscape, sorry, at that point, without naming or naming up to you? No, sure, so. So, you know, uh, education, uh, the reason for education, I sort of explained, right? Why, why education? And just, to me, the bigger the problem, uh, the bigger the opportunity. Right. Sure, and and so nowhere did that stick out more than in education. Now within education, just trying to decide, you know, uh, what exactly do you do? And by the way, before that, oh. you know, I had a, another startup which was in healthcare. Right, so sure. for me, my passion sort of always had been I, I wanted to do businesses that uh, while I am actually working away at them at uh, the problem, uh, I'm giving back. Right, so I don't have to wait till I'm old to give back. Impact. Who, who knows whether I'm yeah. hit or not till I'm old, right? Yeah. Uh, so that was the idea. Yeah. But, but the, you know, so so as I was thinking about within education, some of the things that were things from my past was, you know, I I I'd done things offline, right? Mm. So chain of pharmacies and clinics. So I, I was just used to uh, offline, and I also realized, like, you know, I, I was looking at what was happening with tech, and what was important for me was uh, generating cash flow. Hmm. Right? So. So okay, what what can you do uh, that generates cash flow uh, within the education space? I was also thinking about regulations, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, schools, for example, K twelve education is completely closed off to uh, foreign investment, right? And not just foreign investment. Uh, uh, K twelve education is closed off to uh, any uh, uh, private investment, so so any for profit structure. Hmm. So it has to be a trust structure. I thought, you know, there is ways potentially to get around that, but uh, do I really want to be doing that? Uh, huh. And then, I, I you know, I, I, I was looking at China, Japan, uh, different markets, 
what I realized is the biggest market probably is this after school market. Okay. Uh, and one of the great things about the after school market was you don't have to be tied to the teachers hmm. that are, uh, you know, so you don't have to be tied to people who are coming from a specific background. Uh, education wise <laughs> and so the pool of people that you can get access to is much wider because basically education is you, you, you know mostly comes back to the teacher it's sure a, and so how do you provide access to the best teachers well first we wanted to make sure that we have enough of a supply to choose from <laughs> and so that's how we ended up on okay offline after school uh, and then you know what specifically do we focus on? So we ended up focusing on English, math, and coding, right? Okay. Uh, which, again, back to what we were saying, yeah. are just probably the most relevant skills for sure. the 21st century. Sure. So that's how we ended up on our on our initial model, which was offline chain of uh, centers. centers. And they were beautiful, Sam. Sure. You know, cool. We had four centers. Uh, unfortunately, they're not up and running. Otherwise, your, your, your son would have loved them. Sure. <laughs> uh, uh, so... We we had four centers. Uh, one was in Base Day, cool. another one in Pintaro, Big, and um, uh, Bagasi. And so we we started with that. But what we realized is, you know, it was good business. Cool. Uh, it was becoming profitable relatively quickly. Cool. Uh, but it wasn't scaling so fast. Cool. And so we thought, you know, and and also the market that we were serving was, we were charging almost seven to eight million. Uh, per semester. Per se- okay, and that's that's pretty high. So, uh, that you know, we we start sort of started realizing that this is a limited market that we're yeah. serving. Uh, so then from there we started going to. We said, hey, you know what? There's forty thousand uh, mom and pop tutoring centers in the country. Huh. Why don't we modernize them? Huh. So we started doing that, where we had a, a partnership with about a hundred uh of you know mom and pop centers. Sure. But we realized it's very hard to control the that way. Yes. And right around that time was when the pandemic was hitting. Um, and so we just had to decide, okay, does the future for us look like it's online or or offline? Mm. And we felt certainly offline will be relevant. Students will want to see their friends, their teachers, right? So we mm. always thought that would be important. Uh, but, you know, we thought hybrid is not about hybrid, uh, hybrid school or hybrid uh, after school uh-huh. hybrid to us meant offline school online after school right? okay okay um, and what we thought is look uh, again of course not everybody will want online after school so hmm. people will still want that one on one to train sure part, right but the basic idea that we had was or the thought that we had was you know if education is about getting the best teacher uh, to the students how can we do that best right mm-hmm. and then we thought uh, online is the way to solve that Right, where any teacher from across Indonesia uh-huh. uh, can teach any student from across the country. Okay, so any teacher, they're not really curated or on colon payrolls as such. No, sorry. So, so no, I, I was saying, you know, potentially. And potentially, okay. So, okay. so uh, but what colon does itself, you know, is so we, we had, mm-hmm. so we, we had two main products. Uh, one uh, was uh, AI-powered homework helper. Right. Okay. So basically, you know, students could take a picture of a question, uh-huh. and uh, we we created about almost a million videos in the back, and okay. uh, through OCR, yeah. we match the question, yeah. the video uh, from our. Uh, it's a live product. It's a live product. Yeah. So but now we moved it over to YouTube. Right. Okay. Um, all the content. So this this was pre-chat GPT. This was pre-chat GPT. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. Right. Uh, just uh, how how does this work? I am very curious. So basically, a student is you know doing their maths or sure. physics or camp homework, right? Yeah. And just take a picture of of your question. Okay. Uh, you crop it. Uh, you send it to us, and within less than a second, mm-hmm. uh, we would deliver a video solution that matches exactly that question. Question. Right. Okay. And it's been explained by an expert tutor. Sure. Uh, where it's not just the answer. How do you, you know, what's the background problem? What's sure. the question really asking here? Uh, how do you work through it? So it's basically like if you had access to a one-on-one tutor, mm-hmm. that's what it would feel like. Must be a very massive repository. Yeah? It, in it was, of, uh, and it and it cost us a lot on the cloud as well. Well, yeah, we were talking about it. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. So that was the first part. But the idea really was, you know, we because we've been learning from China and all these places, right? and one of the things I realized is 
you will never make money with AI, right? In a B2C business, B2C, yeah. B2C, it is very, very tough to mm. make money with AI mm. uh, because prices do- tend to go down to free, right? True, right. Uh, true, right. Race to the bottom. True, true. And so we always knew that there has to be, you know, another element. And actually for us, the most important thing was, again, back to our philosophy that you need the best teachers in front of uh, students. Cool. And so for us, this was actually just a way to funnel students from uh, our free product into our paid product, paid product. was the live classes. Mm-hmm. And with live classes, the idea is it's one to many. Uh, so if you want to have the best teacher teaching uh, you know, students, it can't be a one-to-one format because then you're limited uh, with the supply. So the the idea was you know, one, one teacher teaching anywhere between 50 to uh, 100 kids uh, at one time. Mm-hmm. But uh, all cohort based, right? Uh, you define define a cohort over here. A cohort is you have the same group of friends hmm. who come to a class. Uh, uh, so you have the same teacher, so, same group of friends regularly. The okay, with all the students who are in the class. Yeah, and the students will know each other. Sure, sure. So how how was the pandemic for you guys? I mean, uh, globally there there was a massive uh, growth which all the edtechs uh, observed. Uh, across segments, be it, uh, be it uh, K-12 or beyond. Mm. Uh, how was it for you? It's good and bad. Okay. Um, for the same reason, sure. uh, which is that we raised a lot of money. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. So, yeah. so, you know, it was good that we raised money based on, because we had almost 5 million monthly active users yeah. across, you know, the country that we're using it. Mm-hmm. And it was a time when you could raise capital based on it. Yeah. And, you know, we got carried away, right? Sure. Uh, because we thought, hey, this is, you know, uh, and, and that was sort of the push that you had, right? In, mm. hey, what if others are raising money? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. You know, there was this question that people would ask, you know, and it's a winner takes all market, right? right? Uh, everyone was seeing that across, you know, with India as well. Hey, you know, one big player who all the capital goes to. Yeah. And they will annihilate everyone else. Right? Mm. And uh, so I, I guess that was, you know, it was good because we, we raised the money, but it was bad because, like I said, you know, we we lost sight of what it was that we were really trying to build, which was mm. the second product, the life classes. Life classes, yeah. um, life classes are, you know, operationally more complex, right? Uh, but like I said, you know, it's actually the fact that they are operationally complex, which uh, gives us the hope of, Scale and revenue affordability. So, um, so yeah. So, so to answer your question, you know, I think we we had a huge surge in the free product, but what it did did not translate to is people switching over from the free product to the paid product, product, right? And um, and in the last uh, few months, you know, we just uh, last year or so, we just realized, hey, look, you know, uh, or actually, since twenty twenty two, we realized this is not the path. Uh, that we want to go down, we saw with everything that was happening with interest rates, hmm. and this was sort of my second rodeo, right? Yeah. Uh, and I realized, you know, but my, maybe with my first time, I did not learn the lesson hard enough. Huh. But the second time, I was sure, like, you know, hmm. when you have one one dot, you don't know if it's a pattern, but with two dots, you can draw a line. Correct. Uh, Correct. And so Correct. this is a pattern, right? So hmm. before, I think what we did well is as soon as we saw the signs of this happening and we realized that, hey, we've, you know, gotten off course, we quickly started correcting that, right? Hmm. Uh, uh, in hindsight, I wish even quicker. Sure. Uh, but one of you know, so what we were able to do is with the capital that we raised, you know, preserve it, hmm. uh, and uh, like I said, move our content from our app hmm. onto YouTube, right? Hmm. Uh, so save on cloud costs, uh, save on other you know uh, infra tech costs. Hmm. Uh, and just really focus in on our second product, which is life classes. Okay, okay. You, you've given you've given you've given me so much of context <laughs> right now. Let me let me uh, let me ask a question about uh, the whole philosophy of moving uh, your offerings from your own channel to, to a third party channel. Uh, typically, it's very looked down upon by the uh, by the investors by the venture world. Right, yeah. you should own your content. It should be out there on your own channel. What are you building if you are using a third-party channel uh, to push this? I mean, the active users are not your users; they are YouTube's active users. How did you overcome that? 
stunning for me to say here. Look, um, as uh, uh, I mean, I, I went into this, you know, we went into this thinking we're not going to raise money anymore, right? Okay. This is it. This is the capital that we have, hmm. right? This is soon that now we have to be profitable, hmm. right? And uh, obviously nobody wants a dollar of profit, right? Profit yeah. has to be able to scale as Sure. So we were in a position where we had enough capital to where we can, if we just focus in, hmm. uh, then we can we can achieve everything else that we want. So we, for us, we decided, hey, look, you know, this this actually this first piece that we were doing, hmm. it sort of became a distraction. Right? Okay. Uh, and uh, so, you know, uh, fortunately, I think most of our investors have been understanding enough yeah. uh, to where because they also see uh, they see that that hmm. argument. Also. Sure, sure, sure. No, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, what what uh. What do you think of the whole education tech as a as a sector in Indonesia? Right, where, where are we exactly? At what phase are we? Because uh, the reason I'm asking you this is there have been a lot of uh, a lot of contradicting views uh, in the last few years. Uh, one which Rick really went up during COVID was that hey, listen, this is a behavioral change, and it's gonna stay. Right, online. Education is the thing going forward. Going forward, even the schools are going to become hybrid, right? I mean, you will spend two hours in the school and the rest you want to study online. And uh, but to uh, to an extent, it, it, se- it seemed to be pretty fair because you really didn't know how the uh, COVID would shape up, uh, how the whole uh, next few years would shape up, right? But now that we have that clarity, uh, what do you think? Where are we uh, as an ecosystem when you talk about education tech in Indonesia? I think the problem with ed tech mm. is not isolated to Indonesia. I think it is a you know probably an Asia problem, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, you know. Okay. More, I would say, India and Indonesia problem. Right? Okay. Uh, and I think it's also the fundamental problems that you're seeing in ed tech are not just ed tech specific. Mm-hmm. They're actually, you know, everything that's happened with tech, right? And what we were discussing earlier. Mm-hmm. I think what's, people got carried away, right? And as a result, uh, people lost sight of what truly matters, right? And everybody was in this race of trying to sell their story, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and investors were buying it, right? Yes. And, uh, you know, what people lost sight of is, for example, in Indonesia, mm. it's a country, you know, uh, you, if you look at GDP per capita in this country, it's a very misleading. Yes. In India as well. I mean, uh, I always say just remove the top 1% and then let's talk about GDP per capita. Yeah. Just remove, just remove the Ambani's and the Adani's and the Tata's and then let's talk now. Because I mean, the, the average is pretty bad. <laughs> exactly. I, in, in, in Indonesia, Hey, yes. What is the immediate income in this country? Well, surprise me. No, no guesses, even. Three million rupiah. Oh. Three million rupiah. So it's two point two. Two point. All right. Uh, yeah. So meaning fifty percent of people oh. aren't below that number, right? Yeah. And so, if you want to build a B two C business, right? And mm. how can you build a B two C business? Uh, forget ed tech, any B2C mass market business. Hmm. Hmm. How can you build it if you, first of all, if your price point is, uh, you know, in a few hundred or thousands of dollars, right? Hmm. Uh, and I think that's fundamental mistake that has happened in ed tech because as people were chasing valuations, they were trying to show how much revenue they had and even the revenue that uh, people were showing was all, you know, Collected up front, right? Mm, like mm. Accounting standard-wise, not even correct, right? Uh, in some cases, the revenue accounted for tablets and the devices as well. Yeah, I mean, and this was, by the way, it's not isolated to one company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, I mean, we we also started doing right, Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you know, and not obviously not for our accounting, official accounting purposes, mm, but mm. in the way we thought about the business. Yeah. But that was the wrong way to do it, right? Uh, and, and so, you know, in this country, you know, so... What I what I started doing is we started shifting who we are learning from, right? Mm. And uh, I started looking more at like the Mayoras, 
right? Mm. Uh, you know, the you know if you've seen the Bang Bang Chocolate, yes. or Five Star in India, right? And one of the things you realize from that is that chocolate bar keeps getting thinner and thinner and thinner. Yes, but the price doesn't change. Yeah, price remains the same because price is so 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 important. Correct. And the reason it's important is not because people don't care about quality, but when you are earning two point two million or less, or you know around that number. You have to pay your rent. You have to pay for uh, gasoline. You have to pay for your kid's education. You have to pay for your phone bill, for your internet bill. You know, and by the time you get to discretionary income, there's just very, very, little. very little. True, true. You better have a a damn good product, right? Uh, and B, uh, it needs to be priced properly, mm. right? Uh, and so I think that basically about ed tech. Is what got lost, right? As people were trying to sell one year, two year, three year packages, uh, and that was basically fear about the product, right? You're not sure uh, mm. if this will work or not, right? It sure. will retain or not if you give them the chance. So uh, in our case, you know, basically, I turned forty last June, right? Right around the time when uh, everything was, you know, falling apart in the tech world, right? yeah. uh, and and I I just realized, hey, you know what? Like you and I were speaking. Came back to opportunity cost. Sure. I said, look, this is in my 40s, right? My co founder is also, you know, uh, similar age. And we said, hey, uh, is it worth it? Right. Mm. And uh, the way we decided, look, uh, we think we've built a great product, even on the live classes. I mean, that, in fact, we thought we just, you know, we've done a very good job there. Mm. But the numbers, when we were trying to get students in to mm. this, this AI uh, homework channel, wasn't mm. working. So we said, look, let's just, you know, if this is true about what B2, what our thesis is about B2C, mm. let's just go with this. So, mm. A, we slashed prices from, you know, a few hundred dollars down to $7 a month. Right? Okay. For life classes. For life classes. Okay. Two, we said, uh, let's break the convention of people paying semesterly, yearly, right? Give people a chance to pay monthly, right? Cool. Uh, hey. And uh, three, uh, when people try this, give them a money back guarantee. Mm. Now, the reason we wanted to, you know, not give a free child mm. is because people are not serious then. So we yeah. let them commit to seven dollars. Let them kids come. Their kids come. They don't enjoy. We give mm. the money back, right? Well, so no questions asked. No questions asked. Right? Okay. And uh, that's the change that we made last year. Cool. Uh, and uh, since then, things you know sort of have been taking off for us, right? Uh, uh, and uh, oh yeah, so so you know, I guess for us, we have to see if this sustains. And you know, uh, but I, I think one of the key things for us has been, and and again, back to your question about ed tech, what I think about it. I think whether ed tech or any business, the key way to determine whether or not you have a business is does your customer come back, of right? Course. And and does your customer come back without any promos? Hmm. Right, hmm. and does your customer come back for a paid product, not a free product? Right, to show often in retention Direct. around uh, free. So, with pay and without promos, hmm. uh, and and I think that's the test that we put ourselves through, right? Hmm. And and that's the number that's been working for us, right? So customers just coming back, um, the results are good. I mean, the results are good. I, I think, in fact, you know, it's uh, from everything I, I I don't know of 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 any company in ed tech that is actually doing monthly payments uh, oh. in India or Southeast Asia right? Mm. Uh, mm. at this price point sure. with a money back guarantee. And I think with the with these things... And actually giving the money back. We are. Uh, yeah. So, so we, but we only get about, only about, uh, you know, a very, very small percentage of people actually ask for the money back, even though nice. we remind them about three to four times yeah. during the journey. Of, that your free trial is about to end. Uh, well, I mean, even after it ends. Okay. Hey, you know what? It's not a free. Not so, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. In case if you're like. So, when they onboard with us, we tell them, hey, just a reminder, right? Mm. Sales tells them, our mm. ads tell them. When they onboard with us, we tell them, remind mm. them again. Mm. And when their month is over, we remind them one more time, hey, mm. listen, in case you're unhappy, mm. you can get the money back, right? Mm. Uh, and even with that, they're a very small percentage. So, I think that's what's been working for us uh, retention, right? The sure. students keep coming back. Sure. But I think, you know, just generally with ed tech, this point was lost, mm. right? It does. Does the student actually want this product? Right. Uh, do they? You you tell them for us or just gently? Just, just from your observation, do the do the students over here uh, 
have they really adopted to online learning? No, uh, uh, absolutely. I, I think that's, you know, the so the two big questions hmm. around EdTech in Indonesia specifically was A, uh, online adoption and B, people's willingness to study, right? Yes. Uh, is there some deeper cultural issue? Right. Uh, and probably the only difference is that you don't have as many tiger parents, right? Hmm. But again, if I, it goes back to this income segment, right? Yeah. Often what's good right. is you're thinking about the top one, two, three percent of people who are these tiger fans. Even in India, yeah, yeah. those people are not like, correct, right? uh, uh, but just happens the people you end up having coffee with are mm. that, right? Yes. And um, so, so you know, I don't think Indonesia is very different. Yes, maybe mm. to some extent, yes, mm. uh, slightly different, but parents here do have a desire for a better future for their children. They do understand that math and science and whatnot are right. important, and English are important for their kids' future. Sure. Uh, kids are kids. I don't know whether it's Indonesia or India. They mm-hmm. like to play. They, you know, studying is not necessarily the thing that they love the most, mm-hmm. right? Uh, uh, but one of the things that I, I, again, I don't know this about India very well, but about Indonesia specifically, what we see is that uh, girls here mm-hmm. have a much higher willingness to study. Uh, and so we even see this when we speak to parents. Sometimes when the parents know that I, it's their son, mm. they just give up, right? <laughs> but if it's a daughter, they know that my daughter was. <laughs> so we are, we have an eighteen member team in Indonesia, all girls. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So you know, yeah, I, I think that's definitely. So again, I I don't have enough data. Yeah, you know, sure. About whether this is a fundamental difference between India and Indonesia. Ooh, ooh, yeah. ooh. Okay. Uh, who are really your customers? Whom do you sell to? Parents or students? Uh, so it's parents. Yeah, uh, sure. So, so look, uh, it's. I think this is where ed tech is a more complicated. I mean, it's 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 always been very really fascinating to me, especially from ed tech perspective. This part particularly, right? Yeah. Who are really the customers? Because the users are different. The paying customers are different, right? It's the parents, and then the students are the kids are the students. No, I think it's. So it's obviously both, hmm. but you know the clarity that I think I have now hmm. is uh, it has to be the parent. So it's you know sort of like when you go uh, on a hurdle race, right? Uh, first hurdle you have to cross is hmm. the parent, hmm. and if you try to change this hurdle, it doesn't work. Hmm. First hurdle has to be the parent hmm. because they have to believe in the brand, right? Hmm. Uh, uh, so that that's the first. Part of, right? Uh, they have to they have to agree with the pricing. They have to feel like this is going to solve my uh, kids' issue. Hmm. But the second hurdle then is, and which is the larger hurdle, hmm. is the right. Hmm. Uh, and so it is still at the end a joint decision uh, between both. Uh, but again, sequentially, you uh, you know, at least for us, our clarity you know, that we now have, then it took us several years to get. True. Is you have to go to the parent first, hmm. and then this. Okay. Okay. And how do you go about reaching these guys? You have a sales team in place or uh, it's digital? Yeah. Mostly digital. Uh, and then um, all of our sales is also done uh, via WhatsApp. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, the reason I ask you this is because I mean, in India, it's been uh, uh, a massive issue, right? I mean, uh, the way one of the largest ed tech players globally rather, uh, uh, which is based in India, has been pursuing sales, uh, pretty much shaming the parents that he listen your kid is like, da. It's, it's uh, I mean, he really, he or she really needs what we are selling uh, for uh, him or her to really grow in life. Uh, the sales tactics have been under f- uh, a lot of fire, right? Uh, and uh, it's pretty unfortunate. It worked for them initially. The whole shaming thing worked for them. Uh, I mean, I find it really unfortunate because, I mean, if it works for a company and, I mean, especially a venture-backed company, which is, which needs to report growth quarter on quarter, they'll basically keep doubling down on that strategy, right? Uh, hence, I was very curious on how sales works for uh, you. So, I mean, but just to, just to add to that point, yeah. uh, we actually, so we had this, you know, uh, this period where, like I said, we got caught up as well. 
True. And we were trying to sell expensive packages, right? Uh, no one, you know, a few hundred dollars. Yeah. Uh, and then we brought the price down. Uh, mm. So when we realized then also, it was much easier to sell offline, right? Mm. And then we started realizing, well, if you want to expand the market, you have to offer buy now, pay later, right? Yeah. Uh, and and then when you have a field sales force, you can't control that. You can know what they're saying to the True. Field. Exactly, yes. You know, to meet their target, yeah, they yeah. Uh, say a lot of things. Right. Like, uh, and so, but, you know, I, I guess I'm fortunate, you know, because, and my, my, my co-founder, uh, he, when you met, yeah, yeah. He, he just said, hey, look, it uh, doesn't make sense, right? Like, why are we going down this path? Let's just kill this, right? Like, you know, mm-hmm. we, if we're going to have a business, we might as well have a business which will deliver dividends for us, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the road, right? True. Uh, if not, like, again, back to that opportunity cost, why are mm. we wasting our prime? Yeah, in building something that will not even last, uh, you know, into the future. Mm. And uh, and so we that's why we decided to say, you know, hey, just kill this whole offline sales team, this buy now pay later, mm-hmm. and just figure out if you can actually build a a model that scales. Sure, sure. No, and that, that that absolutely makes sense. It absolutely makes sense. Let's talk about the teachers a bit, right? Uh, I'll, I'll just share my thoughts, and then I would love to hear uh, from you. So. Uh, At least in the developing economies, I feel teachers are one of the most underpaid, but the most crucial uh, pillars of the society. But they're the least paid, right? Uh, I've known of people who become teacher only because they can't do anything else, which is, I mean, which, which is so damaging overall uh, from a society perspective. Right. Uh, how does that? How do you see that in Indonesia? Right. I mean, uh, do we have teachers who really love teaching at 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 a larger scale, or is it uh, just very really very similar to other developing economies wherein teachers are out there for the sake of it? And uh, also, before I end the point, one important part is the premium education. Right. So, if you talk about premium schools. Uh, and other spaces, the teachers are really well paid. I I agree completely. But again, then you're talking about the top zero point zero one percent of the country as such. And I can talk. The, I can say this about any developing country, yeah. especially in Asia, right? So, uh, and I my hope was that edtech is going to solve for that. Exactly. That edtech is going to b- bring teachers who really love teaching. Uh, and they're going to give them a very large audience, a very large student base. So a large number of students can benefit from it. Right. No, uh, that's exactly what EdTech should be solving, right? Mm-hmm. I think in, in this part of the world, right? How can it do it? So so I think back to your point around teachers, right? first of all, mm-hmm. maybe I'll, I'll just answer that. So I'll, yeah. you know, the 0.1%, forget mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the masses, I think there's truth to your statement. Right. Uh, I think, in fact, you're very. Uh, seems like you, yeah. Not many people realize when you do that that teaching is a profession which is often one of the lowest paid, and um, because of that, it becomes sort of this negative cycle, all the way starting from college, because you know, uh, so sort of the best students can end up going into uh, uh, medical engineering and others, yeah. Right. right, and doesn't mean that obviously. I mean, there are people who are super passionate about teaching. Correct, is why they very handful, uh, very handful. Exactly. And, and, yeah. So, so, uh, so that is an issue, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and because of that, again, this sort of negative cycle just continues with the student experience and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. So I think that's something that a cycle that needs to be broken, and that's government's uh, task to do that, right? Uh, but you're right. I think that's the gap that edtech should be fulfilling uh, because what edtech can do, like I said, you're not limited by who you hire, hmm. right? You don't have to hire uh, folks from a specific uh, uh, educational background. It can be anyone. Sure. Uh, but then uh, you also have to be willing to pay them more competitively, hmm. right? Uh, and so... Yeah, so I mean, like again, so, uh, there are two, two parts to it, right? One is when we talk about 
teachers and professors on on uh, on a scale wherein they are teaching in the schools, universities, colleges, etc. Right, uh, and that uh, yeah, I agree. It's pretty much on the government on how they can actually increase the uh, the pay. Uh, but especially on the edtech side, I mean, uh, with the amount of funding which was available, with the amount of uh, runway which was provided, and I'm not talking, I'm just talking about industry in general, okay? Right? Uh, my my uh, hope was that they'll end up creating a new breed of teachers, right? Either empowering the existing teachers or like just creating a new breed of teachers, teachers who are just coming out or uh, students who have just completed their universities, pay them well, build a ra large audience so that there is a proper match of a tutor who really loves doing what he or she does and then, and this passes on. I mean, look, we've, we've been students. We always remember the teachers whom we knew who really loved teaching, right? This was very visible in the classroom. Again, if you're focused on after school to rent, hmm. I think you, you know you don't have to worry about supply. Hmm. The issue has not been supply. The issue hmm. is back to what I was talking to you about earlier, right? Uh, it yeah. you, you you never crack demand properly. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you can claim that you're you know uh, selling to low income folks, right? Hmm. Uh, but actually, you're selling you know if you and we we did the same thing. Yeah, you end up selling to them if via BNPL. Like number one, how much can you scale? True. Number two, then you know, half the times they're just trying to cancel their subscription. Okay. Right? So it's not really a customer that you have. Mm. Right? Um, and by the way, it's also dependent on the model, right? Yeah, it's recorded content, live classes. So I think uh, it's because people didn't really solve that first piece, right? Uh, that that you know, it never got to this supply issue hmm. uh, being solved the way that you envisioned it. Hmm, hmm, hmm. To me, it's, it's back to that, right? And sure. for, for us, again, it just came back to you know, how do you solve this piece? And, and uh, again, why why record versus um, uh, life lessons? Or it matters. Hmm. It's because if it's recorded content, you don't need that many people. Yeah. But the problem is then you can't generate, you know, the, you don't have attention. You don't have motivation of kids. You, hmm. they, they don't want to watch this stuff, right? Hmm. They don't want to watch recorded content. Hmm. How do you get a student to be in front of a screen for 60 minutes cool. and not playing the game, right? Yeah. And the distractions are heavy, right? Something else. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. And, and I think that part was never solved properly. That part could have been solved by a hardware, you think? No, no, no. I'm saying, you know, so, so I mean, for us, mm. the solution was, hey, you need cohort classes, right? Mm. You need uh, live classes. So for us in the beginning, it was never uh, recorded content that we believed in. Sure. Right? Because we always thought that the basic problem is motivation hmm. uh, of the child, right? And hmm. they need to understand. Hmm. And uh, and we thought that that's best solved through uh, live class format, hmm. right? Where you know the teacher, you know the other students who are studying together with you, and you grow together. Sure, sure. Let's let's talk about uh, one or two ed tech companies, which maybe in in Indonesia, wherever across the globe, right? which you feel has really cracked it, irrespective of the country, the the demographics? You know, I, I, I don't uh, want to sound like... Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's something I've thought about, right? I, I think it's... I mean, that... So the, uh, Give me a thumbnail. I, <laughs> I'd say maybe, you know, Companies like Duolingo, right? Mm. Uh, Tag, you know, in the US, they, mm. you know, I guess Duolingo has done a really good job of sticking it. Yes. Right? Um, uh, so I, the first name that comes to my mind, uh, honestly, is Duolingo, Duolingo. right? Yeah. Um, but I think uh, in this part of the world, there were some great models. Uh, in China, there was Tal, uh, Zoya Bong, right? Uh, mm. That was actually doing a pretty good job. Um, but I think in uh, in closer to sort of you know, India, Southeast Asia, I think fewer, 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 fewer examples. What's what's next for EdTech, according to you? Where are we headed? I think there's going to be a period of silence. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a period where you know people are just afraid of the sector. Uh, there's where people you mean the the venture capital, the, the investors or founders both? Yeah. So so I I think both, right? I mean. Mm -hmm. 
think a lot of the the funding that's come in, mm. uh, you know, fo- founders have been going to edtech mm-hmm. because they they saw this as you know I, I think that's the cycle that you see right whatever yeah. thought mm. uh, you know uh, people yeah. uh, tend to go into that direction, uh, but I I think um, there's going to be a period where there won't be much noise around edtech or if there will be maybe more towards negative. Uh, you know, hmm. uh, it will continue to be that way for some time. Hmm. Uh, and what does that mean for CoLearn? I think it's a good thing. That's a good thing. Uh, it Give, thing. gives you time to really strategize and build. Because you know, uh, again, me, my co-founders, we just don't have to be distracted hmm. by all the things we don't really believe in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, and and we can just keep building away. Right. Hmm. Uh, again, we were fortunate enough to just just raise the right amount. Right. Uh, hmm. And keep it. Uh, and and just make sure that we run a sane business. Hmm. Uh, but I think this, you know, for us, we actually appreciate this period. Sure, 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 sure. So, I mean, it, it sounds sounds like a pretty pretty interesting journey since 2018. I mean, you've seen your ups, you've seen your downs, you've seen COVID with 5 million active users uh, and more. How do you maintain sanity? Uh I mean, this 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 is too much of excitement and thrill, right? You know why? Why? I yeah. tell you, I don't have sand. So you know. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, uh, I think for me, yeah, you know, and for for my co-founders, uh, I think what gives us sanity is when we're making progress, right? Uh, and because this this problem, we've not cracked it, right? Mm. Like we we just saw showing you know, this initial good signs that we're heading in the right direction. Mm. I think yeah, I'm 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 a workaholic, so for sure. me, it's all about work. Uh, and maybe outside of that, uh, uh, just getting a good run or a good yoga session in. Uh, and then, like you said, seeing the kids, seeing the kids. Oh, absolutely! That's that's the best stress booster. But just uh, let's just talk about these signs which you're talking about, right? Signs of progress, right? I mean, again, not delving uh, too much into colon as such. But generally what, uh, and this from my personal experience, right, I mean, you see good signs, uh, you see progress, and then you're like, okay, no, it's not working. And then you want to start doing something else. How do you kill this? Because, I mean, uh, it's a cycle, right? I mean, you started off with, of course, a certain belief in place, uh, a certain uh, growth chart in place, and then it is going slightly in that direction then just starts going down right at what time do you really take that step back and say like boss no this isn't working let's just let's just change the direction I think in our case we've done we've probably gone through most of the iterations that we think Hmm. uh, would happen right and and Finally, we've come back to actually what was our initial hypothesis, right? Uh, it's a full cycle. Full cycle that we've gone through. And for us, you know, again, the key thing that tells me whether or not uh, you have a business is, again, is the customer coming back, hmm. right? And are they coming back without crying more, right? Hmm. Just one consistent price. Hmm. When they have the option to walk away from you every single month, right? Hmm. To get for all these box ticked now. Exactly. So, so you know, now, now for us, it's a question of scaling, hmm. right? Um, and and how quickly we can do that uh, without and, burning. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Right. Uh, because our our goal is to be profitable by the end of this year, right? Sure. Uh, and so, you know, uh, are we on track to do that or not? And again, eventually, sort of how this scales up. Those are the sorts of things that we are thinking about now. Sure. But you know. I think uh, the temptation to pivot uh, is is no longer there. Uh, more because we have scratched uh, that it. Yeah, yeah. Correct, correct. Any plans to go offline again? Uh, no. No. Uh, no. So, so. Very clear on that. Very, 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 very clear. I'm mm. old. <laughs> I, you know, I had one business which was offline. Like, mm. you know, because you put so much time and energy in the one place, mm. the one thing, and, you know, mm. The signboard falls and some more. Then there's some. There's so many issues that can happen. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, for me, no, I I definitely prefer online. Also because 
I see this as the future direction. Right. The parents that are actually expressing interest for us mm-hmm. is the younger parents, right? True. Uh, and they're much more, even those moms in second, third tier city, mm. they're just much more comfortable with uh, their dividing devices. Yeah. You know, the number one media they're on is WhatsApp, and, WhatsApp. and Facebook, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so we, we see that as a future direction. So no, the, uh, I don't find it offline. Sure. You sure. probably see me trying to get a job before you see. <laughs> I, I hope I don't see that. Uh, what What do you think about the overall ecosystem, startup ecosystem in Indonesia? Uh, and give me give me uh, give me pre twenty one and pre uh, post twenty one because I mean uh, we know the insanity which followed, uh, especially in twenty twenty one with the funding rush and more. Uh, Talk about the ecosystem as such. I think people don't know but, what it really means to be profitable. But, if you look at some of the businesses that were, you know, more mature businesses, right? Traditional businesses uh, run by businessmen here. They are the ones who know, but, but, right? Uh, similar to India. But I think uh, the probably the younger generation and younger founders, but, yes, you will hear them post 2021, post 2020, you know, especially in 23 this mm. year, everybody's speaking and singing to the tune of profitability. Mm. But behind that mm. is an underlying desire to raise capital, right? And do what? I mean, what would you want to raise capital for? Exactly, Michael. Right? And I think that's, so, I mean, you asked me, right? Mm. Uh, and I think that's where people sort of get distracted because what I've learned in after, you know, 13 years of doing business is, yeah, it is far easier to convince a investor mm. than to get uh, you know a dollar of profit, right? Uh, and and to get a dollar of profit requires a uh, you know, like you said, long term commitment, focus, right? Focus because the more initiatives you do, the more cost you add to it, right? Discipline, uh, and so I think that's. Uh, unfortunately for a lot of people, you know, they, they start their career and their first job or very early on is a startup, right? Mm. Uh, mm. And you raise capital because you worked at another startup, which eventually never made money, right? And, yeah, uh, yeah. So your fundamentals from there were celebrated, but now, you know, mm. what do you do with this, right? Mm. Versus if you look at, you know, I mean, uh, my, myself, my co-founder, my co-founder is from Accenture. Mm. Uh, I, you know, my, my background was a G, right? Uh, yeah. You just used to, a thinking about things like continuous improvement, yeah. waste management, mm. and you know, like how, how do you make sure that you get rid of waste? Uh, uh, because to deliver a dollar of profit requires just every day chipping away at the problem, right? Right. Uh, and right. without getting caught up in things that look flashy. Um, sure. um, so, so I think that's typically, you know, to me, the issue with Indonesia. Uh, the Indonesian tech ecosystem, and also with the Indian tech ecosystem, right? Uh, I think people just don't think long term enough. People see being a founder as a quick way to become rich, uh, and unfortunately, you know, this was sort of fed in the yeah. last couple of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When actually, you know, and for me, it's very sad to see that you know, if you as a founder, I think, and, and you know, investors as well, I believe, should be making money. When the underlying asset generates cash, correct, uh, and and that sort of has just gotten lost. Mm. And do you think? Uh, do you think the the access to easy money has been uh, is the one which has driven this? Yeah, absolutely. But with access to easy money, I would also assume that the 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 venture capitals would would be coming up with. With their own strategies and theories on how this business will make money gradually, and they would stop if the business not going into that direction, right? I mean, I mean the whole thing. Uh, it sounds flawed if it's not happening that way. So, I mean, the the bigger problem is you have those who are deploying capital, uh-huh. never having run a profitable business of their own. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. So, Everything is sort of borrowed from theory, right? And I think that's where, if I look at PE versus VC, I see PE being a lot more mature, right? Yeah, I mean, of course. And, you know, even investors who have PE experience, so, right, uh, 
find, sure, they may not have run a business on their own, uh, uh, but they've at least seen 20, 30, 40, 50 profitable businesses. Sure. Uh, it, it's just the issue with uh, the VC industry here is, you know, uh, in, in this part of the world is just generally those that are deploying capital huh. and don't have that experience. And so then you don't have anything to fall back, fall back on. Correct. What exactly is it that you really believe in? Hmm. And your belief can change from day to day, right? Yeah. It can change from one hot sector to another hot sector, hmm. from one theory to another theory. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, another interesting trend which I am seeing these days uh, is ex-founders uh, turning venture capitals. I, I mean, in most cases, I am yet to come across any ex-founder who's made a really large profitable company and then exited. It's majorly been uh, an acquisition or an exit or uh, whatever. Uh, and they turning uh, into an uh, venture capital beat and at a partner level or starting a seed fund uh, or more. Do you think uh, at least the advice which we are getting from these ex-founders uh, or hand-holding which we'll get from these ex-founders would be better? It may, it may, be, may be worse. It may be worse, right? Hmm. Uh, because again... You know, you've got to have a template, right? Hmm. Uh, theory is one thing, right? Hmm. Uh, but uh, again, it, if your belief system is based on theory, hmm. it's easily shaken. True. But when it is based on practical data points that have worked for you, right? When hmm. you really know how you generate hmm. that, hmm. Uh, you know, that's another thing. So I think for me, like, you know, if again, if it's folks who... Versus, you know, uh, folks who never, again, it may, it may be different, right? I don't know hmm. the, the, the people that you're specifically referring to. but No, 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 no one specific. I'm just uh, asking a very general opinion. Uh, so so I, I guess, you know, again, it just depends on, you know, do they have a business, underlying business, hmm. uh, which generates cash, right? Hmm. Uh, by the way, I, I, I try to stay away from profitability because, you know, for me, the first thing I want to look at when someone says profitability is like, you know, from one month to another, if I look at your bank statement, does the cash go up or down? Right? Hmm. Because, you know, people are always seeing they're profitable, but yeah. somehow the cash keeps going. Keeps going down, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, everyone has their own definition of profitability. Hmm. But, hmm. but to me, it's back to that, right? So if, if it's someone, a founder, who's actually had experience generating uh, any business or creating any business with generates cash, then I'm, I know, those are the kind of people that I want to learn from. Hmm. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, talking about hot sectors, what do you think is hot now in the market? Uh, obviously AI, right? Uh, is it's probably the the hottest. We are AI powered. No, but I I, I think that's going to be again. You know, it's just to me, it's a massive bubble again, right? Uh, Why do you say so? First of all, I, I again, my basic uh, it's my belief. Huh. Any B two C business, right. AI will never make money. Right. Okay. Uh, if you're a B two B business, uh, sure. And secondly, how about AI powered tutors uh, on edtech? You know, I, I tell our team, right? Mm. Uh, you know, the one place that I just don't see uh, AI mm. uh, or me deploying, us deploying AI is yes. uh, with our teachers, and it's not because we can't. It's possible now, and yeah, just finally possible. You know, a few years ago, yeah. I just don't do work with any of that. Right? I just don't think that's where people take it. Because on the one side, you're talking about offline. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, it's AI. Yeah. Two extremes. Right? Yeah. Uh, uh, and I've just seen this sort of model play out over and over again where right. B2C businesses, you know, people don't want to pay for, for, for AI, right? They will pay for something else. Right? Mm. So AI can complement some other uh, aspect of your business. I think in, in Asia, Southeast Asia, businesses have to have some level of operational complexity, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the other reason why I said, you know, AI is probably a bubble with many of these businesses is because mm -hmm. I think AI, the overwhelming benefits of AI will flow to a few players, right? Um, mm -hmm. Make the most money from it. Uh, everyone else can try to make their businesses more efficient. Well, but in order to do that, you first have to have an underlying business where customers come back to you. Sure. But I mean, uh, so again, just being a devil's advocate over here, uh, you could have said the same thing about internet way back in the 90s, uh, mid 90s, right? That I mean, only a few handful of players are going to make the real big business out of it. 
but then gradually you had a lot of you have a lot of players who meet large businesses on top of it uh, but providers not only providers people who have built products on top of internet internet is the base layer right uh, when we are talking about mid 90s and i mean of course there was a bubble which got burst uh, in the in the states uh, with ai uh, i mean look uh, i agree with you that it's been force fed into everything these days but uh, don't you think that it will find its sweet spots within not let's not say every process but at least half of them it will find its sweet spots and if you're building for that uh and if you're like early in that journey uh, it will end up being beneficial or you can build a large business out of it again yeah, my my sort of big bifurcation is hmm. is it b2c ah uh, okay b2b right? okay i think hmm. it's b2b you can can and i okay. think there's you know uh there's there are businesses that will need uh because i think most traditional businesses that will do well in the future are the ones that will adopt ai hmm. uh and just make their business even more efficient. Sure. For sure there is there is room for that. Right? Hmm. The big sort of bifurcation bifurcation for you. B2C versus. I can't even think of winning good use cases for B2C with AI. I mean do one do one go employ into the uh, use cases for hmm. B2C all are going to the big players. Big players, correct, correct, correct. I I was recently reading that du- Duolingo released a few updates with AI powered I mean uh not really tutors, bots, AI-powered bots, replacing the uh, replacing the translators which they used to hire in the past. They've replaced with them with AI-powered bots within the apps. Which is, I mean, so that makes a lot of sense because that's mm-hmm. basically driving operational efficiency. Yeah, is this model that mm-hmm. works? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which customers pay out there. You created the shoes. Yeah, yeah. make sure you get the profitability quicker, mm-hmm. or you increase your profitability. That that's mm-hmm. what you mean. Sure, sure, sure. I can't even think of any other B two C instances, man. Yeah, you've you've heard read anything recently on B two C? Not that comes yeah. to mind, but I I think you know whenever I do see some of these names, yeah, but, uh, I, that that's always my first. Uh, it's it's a hardly any. I mean, so when Chat GPT was released, I remember there were some few apps which popped up, uh, AI assistant, the best AI assistant B two C, but they just vanished. I mean. It, one example would be us, right? Like mm-hmm. we had this AI powered homework account. Yeah, yeah. It was being used by five million students, right? Yeah. And we just realized that hey, look, this is this is just not gonna make money. Mm-hmm. Uh yeah, yeah. We have five million students using it. But nobody wants to pay for an AI tool, right? Uh and so we, that that's exactly why we decided to move it to to YouTube. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, we are towards the end of this segment. Okay. Uh, the final segment which I want to do with you is, I'm going to put you at the spot. Uh, I want you to give us a 60 second elevator pitch of Colon, which includes what you're doing today and what you're going to do next. Are you ready? Are you going to take what 10 seconds, 15 seconds? I show you the Go for it. Let's go for it. No, good job. You can give me a second take. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so, uh, Colon is a online K twelve ed tech company focused on Indonesian students with the mission of helping students go from the bottom ten percent of uh, PISA rankings to the top te- uh, top fifty percent. Uh, that Indonesian students can be successful on uh, on a global scale and have employment. Uh, we focus our main product now is live classes, where we offer online uh, live cohort based classes. We provide access to students across Indonesia to the best teachers at a very affordable price point of seven dollars a month, um, where we they can pay monthly, and if they are happy, then they get the money back. Um, yeah, super sweet. This is good. This is good. Last thing, uh, leave us with at le- with at least three or four piece of advice for any aspiring entrepreneur, any young entrepreneur who wants to build something. In today's scenario, today's market, what would be three or four pieces of advice which you want to uh, put it out there? Uh, I think first would be when you're doing a business, uh, if you if you want to build something, uh, think about doing it for the rest of your life. Um, don't think uh, that you're going to do this for a couple of years and make money. Uh, uh, it's fine to think that you'll make money, obviously, you know, uh, but... 
think about it as an investment into your future, hmm. uh, where if you do well, uh, it will just keep giving you dividends um, and uh, plan accordingly, right? So then that allows you to just think long term. Sure. Um, uh, and I think most of my other advice is just tied to that, which is don't get carried away by the flavor of the day. Um, don't get carried away by what investors say, right? Have your own beliefs because uh, an investor that is pushing you to do one thing today, their view may completely change you know, a week from now. Uh, but the true test is whether um, your own belief uh, and your own resolve is is firm. And that can only happen if you've properly put thought uh, into whether or not this is something worth doing for the rest of your life. Thank you so much. On that note, uh, it was a pleasure. And I really hope that you guys achieve profitability by the end of the year. Thanks. And we'll do one more next year then. Thanks. One more podcast Thanks. next year. Yes, yes. yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Vipin. Thank you. Thank you.